Good afternoon and welcome to Making Sense of the Turmoil in China. My name is Stephen, the acoustics here are a little bit rough. <laughs> My name is Stephen Gregory and I am the Deputy Editor-in-Chief of the English Language Editions of the Epoch Times. Uh, before going further, I would like to express our thanks to Congressman Dana Rohrbacher for sponsoring our use of this room and to David Berko excuse me, Paul Berkowitz, Staff Director of the Subcommittee on Oversight and Investigations, and Scott Kulanan, Staff Associate for the Subcommittee, for their help in making arrangements for this room. On February 6th, the former police chief of the central western city of Chongqing in China, Wang Lijun, fled to the U.S. Consulate in Chengdu. In doing so, he set in motion a series of events that promised to fundamentally change China. We have seen Wang and his former boss, Bo Shilai, purged, and Hu Jintao and Wen Jiabao assert themselves as they never have before. As power shifts within the party, there are indications that everything is on the table. What role the party should play in China is up for serious discussion. The, the redress of the Tiananmen Square massacre is being considered, as too is the redress of the persecution of Falun Gong. This is a moment ripe with possibility, but in order to respond constructively to the events in China, one first needs to understand what's happening. The Epoch Times has organized this panel to help with this urgent task. In the next hour, we'll hear from our four speakers, and uh, then we'll have questions and discussion. I understand many of you have uh, crowded and busy schedules today. I understand there's a recess coming uh, in a little over a week. And so uh, if, if business calls, uh, please feel free to leave at any time in the proceedings. Um, our first speaker is the Honorable David Kilgore. Uh, we unfortunately live in a time of deep disappointment with politicians and politics in general. But there are examples among us of individuals whose principled actions can redeem politics and public life for us if we take notice of them. David Kilgore is such an example. David served seven terms in the Canadian Parliament and at various points in his parliamentary career was Deputy Speaker, Chair of the Committees of the Whole House, Secretary of State for Latin America and Africa, Secretary of State for the Asia Pacific region. In 2006, he chose not to stand for re-election, and I suspect he did so because there was so much that he could do outside of Parliament. He is co-chair of the Canadian Friends of a Democratic Iran, a director of the Washington-based Council for a, national, for a Community of, de of Democracies, and director of the New York-based NGO Advancing Human Rights. He is also the author, with David T. Jones, Uneasy Neighbors, a book dedicated to making uh, uh, our relations with our neighbors to the north a little bit better, and uh, another book of a different sort uh, with David Mattis, uh, Bloody Harvest, the killing, uh, the killing of Falun Gong for their organs. He and Mattis were nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize in 2010. Uh, I give you David Kilgore. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, and please forgive us for being four men up here. In Canada, I was joking, you cannot have a panel with four men. It has to be either two and two. Ideally, it should be two and two. And uh, the good news, and I know time is short, is that uh, my text, I think, is outside, and I'll just try to give what parts of it to save time. There's so many people who have a lot to say here. Uh, <coughs> Let me start. Uh, democratic governments and their legislators should all be as actively engaged with China's people and party state as feasible during the transitional period that we're under is underway now. Uh, the um, let me illustrate, and you've already mentioned this 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 problem that we're facing, if you like, with Bo Xilai, who whom many democratic governments and business people courted even after it was very clear that he was on his way out. Um, uh, my own prime minister, um, 
uh, for example, met with him in Chongqing on February the, where, February the 11th, nine days after his former police chief, Wang Lijung, had, see, had sought refuge in your uh, consulate in, in Chengdu. Uh, as I'm sure, I hope most of you know, Bo and Wang had earlier been especially brutal persecutors of Falun Gong. Premier Wen Bo was so troubled by Wang's conduct, oh yes, that's probably a good idea, thank you, that um, at his rhetorical question to party members appears to have been leaked from a closed meeting on March the 14th, quote, this is really sh shuddering. Without anesthetic, the live harvesting of human organs and selling them for money, is this something that a human could do? Close quote, asked the Premier of China. Wang also used the many lawsuits launched against Bo in 13 countries for his role in organ pillaging to have him removed as Commerce Secretary in 2007. And I ask, why, why were all uh, democratic governments not supporting Wen on political reform, Wen and other like-minded party members uh, then, and, and how many of them are doing it now? Let me be... Uh, clear on this. Bo Wang, Zhou uh, Yong Kong, who's the head of the political and legislative committee, and others were members of the Jiang Zemin leadership faction. They rose in the party after 99 because they supported uh, Jiang's persecution of Falun Gong after 99. Yet only the recent State Department uh, uh, country reports, I believe that came out on May the 24th, acknowledged for the first time, ladies and gentlemen, to the best of my knowledge, that uh, after seven years, that organ pillaging of Falun Gong is occurring. They didn't even acknowledge it themselves. They said there are reports that Falun Gong organs are being uh, pillaged. So one hopes that the US and other governments will in the support political reform in China uh, more vigorously in the future. And I know that some of the congressmen uh, have done an excellent job in this, and I, I salute them. I think you all know who they are. Um, a couple of other topics I'd like to mention. For example, is political Maoism ending? Um, the methods of Mao did not perish when he did in, in 1976. The, uh, the part he still uses overwhelming force to suppress voices uh, advocating dignity for all and the rule of law. One, of course, is Gao Zhisheng, a thrice Nobel Prize uh, nominated lawyer. A decade ago, as I'm sure many of you know, he was named one of China's top lawyers. The party wrath was released though when he decided to defend Falun Gong. He began with removal of his permit to practice law, an attempt on his life, a police attack on his family, and a cessation of his income. It intensified when he responded in the nonviolent tradition of Gandhi by launching a nationwide hunger strike calling for equal dignity for all. One of his communiques described more than 50 days of torture in, uh, in prison. Uh, I must say something about the, the, the Tibet and the Dalai Lama. Another example of ongoing Gao misgovernance in, is Tibet and the Dalai Lama. He's the spiritual le leader of Tibetans. He's an honorary citizen of Canada and a respected world leader. His Holiness is Beijing's best hope for a peaceful resolution of the Tibet issue. Advocating Tibetan autonomy under Chinese rule, he disavows violence, does not favor secession, and has this year turned over the political role to democratically elected men and women. He spoke recently, or, or a couple of months ago, to a large audience in Ottawa. He indicated that he felt the Chinese people generally would accept a degree of autonomy for Tibet if aware that this is all that is being sought. He also mentioned, and I'm sure you're aware of this, the loss of almost 30 Tibetan lives to self-immolation. That simply has to stop. Religious persecution, um, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with that. Just let me say this, that uh, today all faiths have to adapt their religious practices to suit the party's political objectives. Consequently, uh, there are sham ordinations of bishops without a papal mandate. The, uh, the Protestants are tightly regulated to the point that, that uh, millions of them have fled to uh, illegal house churches. And of course, freedom of belief is essential to any open society. 
worried about the, national, the natural environment. Three decades of anything goes economics have done major harm to the people of China, their natural environment, their neighbor, neighbors, and the world as a whole. Consider half a billion Chinese citizens now lack access to safe drinking water, yet many factories continue to dump waste in, into surface water with impunity. Uh, coal now provides about two-thirds of China's energy, and it already burns more of it than Europe, Japan, and the U.S. combined. Many experts conclude that China cannot go green without political change. Um, yes, Ponzi capitalism. Jonathan Manthorpe, a respected journalist in Canada and a long observer of China, concluded last year, the Vancouver Sun, this, quote, what one is seeing in China is variations of what can only be called a Ponzi scheme. A local government without a functioning system for raising tax revenue and riddled with corruption sells development land to garner cash. First getting rid of the farmers living on the land, the land will then be sold to a development company owned by the local government. The municipality has the power to instruct banks to lend the development company the money for the sale. So the local, local government gets its cash, the municipally owned company gets to build a speculative residential or industrial complex and all seems well, close quote. I spotted a related item on this in the Financial Times not long ago. Uh, listen to this, in the coastal city of Wenzhou, luxury apartments are to be built for as much as 70,000 yuan, it's about $11,000, a square meter which is about twice the annual income of the average resident. To finance a 150 square meter apartment in the building would consume every penny of a typical resident's income for 350 years. Uh, a way forward. Our values, American, Canadian, European, Asian, all uh, uh, value, universal values must be asserted continuously in dealings with Beijing. There were 180,000 mass incidents in China in 2010, everything from strikes to riots and demonstrations, twice as many as 2006. The regime continues to rely on repression and brutality to maintain itself in office. Um, an interesting post-Taiwan election piece appeared in the New York Times. Uh, it noted that the Chinese party state news agency, Xinhua, and perhaps they're here today, avoided the words president and democracy, presenting the election as a merely local one. A businessman from China who had observed the election, however, added, quote, this is an amazing idea to be able to choose the people who represent you. I think democracy will come to China. It's only a matter of time, he said. A democratic China would not be killing Falun Gong citizens in forced labor camps. That it continues to happen is a key indicator of acute misgovernance. So in conclusion, Governments of open societies and their private sectors should examine why they are supporting the violation of so many universal values in order to increase trade and business with China. For years, as you all know, this has resulted mostly in our jobs being outsourced to China and continuous increases in our bilateral trade deficits. Do those in our business communities so overinvested in China feel no responsibility to uh, the employment needs of Americans and Canadians? Are the rest of us too focused on access to inexpensive consumer goods and essentially ignoring the human, social, and natural environment costs paid by the Chinese people to produce them? Uh, Peter Navarro, a professor at the University of California, asserts that the consumer markets worldwide have been conquered by China largely through cheating. For um, its trading partners, Navarro has various proposals intended to ensure that trading becomes fair for once. Specifically, he says that all trading nations should, I'll just give a couple, define currency manipulation as an export subsidy and add it to other subsidies when calculating anti-dumping and countervail penalties. Ban the use of forced labor effectively, not just on paper, and you probably know your government in America has an agreement on this, which is simply uh, observed in the breach rather than uh, enforced, and provide decent wages and working conditions for all. Apply provisions for protection of the natural environment for all trade agreements. F so finally, the, par the party state in Beijing is making major changes in its senior personnel. 
Those appointed should seek dignity for all Chinese if they wish to achieve sustainable prosperity at home. The current party state roles in places like Syria, Burma, Iran, Nepal, North Korea, Sudan, Taiwan, Zimbabwe, and elsewhere will also require significant change if a new government's goal is to build international harmony with justice for all nations. The people of China, ladies and gentlemen, want the same things as the rest of us, education, safety and security, good jobs, the rule of law, democratic governance, and a sustainable natural environment. If the party state ends its violations of human dignity at home and abroad and begins to treat all members of the human family in an equitable way, the new century can bring harmony for China and the world. Thank you. Thank you, David. If China's virtuoso pianist, Long Long, had known that our next speaker, Matthew Robertson, was on the China beat here in Washington, DC, I imagine that on his visit to the White House last year, he might have played the Moonlight Sonata, or a Chopin Etude, or Chopsticks, anything other than the tune he did play, My Motherland. In a series of reports, Matthew showed how this song contained within it a very well-known anti-American propaganda tune, how Long Long and the entire Chinese delegation had to know of the import of this song, and how the playing of it had been planned well in advance. His articles on Long Long and his performance at the White House uh, went viral as Americans were indignant at what many described as a slap in the face of the United States. This episode put on display for uh, readers of uh, Drudge and uh, followers of talk radio and, and <laughs> news programs around the world, uh, the qualities in Matthew that we at the Epoch Times have almost come to take for granted. Original, rigorous reporting and a keen eye for what is really significant in an event that others might overlook. Today, Matthew will speak on the key to understanding China's political crisis. Matthew. Thank you. <clears throat> um, if you're a regular reader of our newspaper, you'll know that our columnists have accurately foretold the dramatic events that have unfolded recently in China. There's an underlying issue that our journalists understand, which allows us to see the current situation with clarity. It explains the sudden and dramatic fall of Bo Xilai. It even provides insights into how and why Google was forced out of China. I'm going to make what may sound like a bold assertion, that Falun Gong and the persecution of Falun Gong is the core issue behind the extraordinary political events we see unfolding in China today. Our failure to understand Falun Gong's impact and consider it in our relations with China wouldn't just mean putting human rights on the back burner. It would mean engaging with China with our eyes closed. First, at risk of being seen to downplay the importance of other very serious human rights concerns inside China, I will stress that my co-panelist, um, Yang Xia, will describe how the repressive apparatus developed over the 13 years of persecuting Falun Gong practitioners has been used more recently to target human rights defenders of all types. There are four points um, in this discussion. The first is that there is a faction in the CCP that has been seeking to overturn settled arrangements um, in the Communist Party and seize power. We first learned about this in February. Wang Lijun was the chief of police for Bo Xilai, who, ru who ruled the giant city of Chongqing in central western China. Wang fled to the American consulate in Chengdu, sp uh, spent uh, you know, several hours away by car. He'd been under investigation by Party Central. Um, Bo apparently feared that Wang would crack um, and turned on him. What was, uh, Wang was fleeing for his life. It wasn't simply to share evidence implicating his boss's wife in murder, um, because given Wang Lijun's role in large-scale organ harvesting, um, it would be highly unlikely that he would suddenly uh, grow a conscience and want to stand up to Bo Xilai over the death of Neil Haywood. Bill Gertz, a national U.S. Uh, security reporter, soon reported that Wang Lijun had revealed to the U.S. officials that Bo Xilai and Zhou Kang were plotting to thwart the ascension to power of Xi Jinping. Um, who should assume the leadership of the CCP later this year or early next year if the party congress is delayed. 
The alliance between Bo and Zhou was well known. Zhou, Zhou Yongkang is the domestic security star in the Communist Party, and he has publicly pushed for Bo Xilai to be named to the Standing Committee, which is the group of nine men who rule the Communist Party. And for Bo Xilai to take Zhou's place in running law enforcement in the country. Wang revealed there was more to this alliance than meets the eye. After Xi assumed office, Bo and Zhou Yongkang planned on pushing Xi aside and promoting Bo Xilai to the top. The Epic Times had its own Chinese sources that affirmed what Goetz had reported, and so did a number of dissident Chinese language media who have accurately reported the unfolding events in this political drama. Further corroboration emerged in a story the Epic Times broke about why Google was forced out of China. Bo and Zhou Yongkang wanted to manipulate internet searches so that information embarrassing to Xi Jinping, as well as Wen Jiabao and Hu Jintao, would appear in searches. Um, they would use the internet to weaken them. In order to control internet searches, they made a deal with Baidu, Google's primary China-based search competitor at the time, um, to force Google out. And Baidu would collect Google's market share, and then Baidu would tailor internet searches to suit Bo and Zhou's agenda. Zhou and Bo succeeded in pushing Google out, and Baidu's search results for Xi Jinping, Hu Jintao, and Wen Jiabao, written in Pinyin, began returning articles with titles like Hu Jintao's son terribly corrupt, Jiang Zemin wants to get to the bottom of it, and Xi Jinping is a lecher, plays with women in Zhejiang behind his second wife, and so forth. To sum it up, Bo and Zhou Yongkong sought to seize power through extraordinary means. The media have often reported the infighting in China. This word is misleading. It's not parliamentary manoeuvring. It is deadly serious, and before this is over, we may see executions. My second point, the decision to persecute Falun Gong forced Jiang Zemin to build an alternative power structure inside the Communist Party. In 1999, Jiang Zemin began the persecution against Falun Gong. It was a divisive, controversial thing to have done. In the end, it completely backfired and has turned into a nightmare for the party. It's worth looking back to something written at the time. In November of 1999, John Pomfret of the Washington Post wrote, the campaign has revealed dissent at the top echelons of power, undermining the image of China's leadership as united and pragmatic. Communist Party sources said that the Standing Committee of the Politburo did not unanimously endorse the crackdown and that President Jiang Zemin alone decided that Falun Gong must be eliminated. Consider the enormity of what Jiang decided to, on his own to do. Between 70 and 100 million people were practicing Falun Gong in China in 1999. Each of those individuals has family, friends, neighbours and colleagues. Jiang, in effect, set the Communist Party at war against a huge fraction of the Chinese people. Jiang thought his campaign would be over in three months. When he found that wasn't the case, he had to improvise. Because the campaign was not popular, he was recruiting officials with bribery, blackmail and coercion. He needed to create a faction that had direct personal ties with him. Jiang had to ensure that the persecution would continue, otherwise he would have reason to fear his legacy, his freedom, and in the end, even his life. Once the party stopped the persecution, that huge part of the population that had been damaged would demand an accounting. And so in 2002, when Jiang was scheduled to retire as head of the CCP, he expanded the standing committee and put two of his people, Luo Gan and Li Changchun, on it. In addition, he had the standing committee change one of their rules um, which changing it from obey the general secretary to work by consensus. This was a means of um, allowing Jiang to keep his people um, still dominating the committee and it meant that he never really relinquished power. In addition to these steps, he built up the Political and Legislative Affairs Committee, or the PLAC, into a second centre of power within the party. The PLAC controls every aspect of law enforcement in China, from police to judges to lawyers to labour camps to surveillance. Its People's Armed Police numbers 1.5 million, the size of an army. Jiang assured that all the means of coercion outside the military were at the command of his allies, giving Jiang and his faction a kind of independence from the Communist Party itself. It's worth pausing to reflect at the sheer cost of an apparatus capable of repressing this number of people. Um, this is a topic that my co-panelist Yang Xia will delve into. The third point, the crimes committed in persecuting Falun Gong were once acknowledged threaten the existence of the Communist Party. 
Morsi Lai has been sued in over a dozen countries for crimes against humanity and genocide. He was indicted by the Spanish National Court in 2009 on charges of genocide and torture. The best guess is that tens of thousands of practitioners have died from torture and abuse. An estimated 450,000 to 1 million are locked up in labor camps right now where they suffer abuse, brainwashing and torture. And throughout China, families have been shattered. There is an entire generation of orphans who have lost one or both parents to the persecution. As horrible as all this is, there's something far worse. The evil of forced live organ harvesting going on in China. The best estimates indicate that tens of thousands of Falun Gong practitioners have been killed for their organs while still alive because the organs deteriorate after brain death. This has been organized by the PLAC and leading members of Jiang's faction are heavily involved. Wang Lijun has bragged in an award speech of overseeing thousands of organ harvesting operations. Shenyang City and Liaoning Province under Bo Xilai appears to have been ground zero for the development of this atrocity. Zhou Yongkang, according to evidence, is also, has also been involved and, and fully cognizant of it. Our newspaper first broke this story and continues to cover it closely. Last month, we reported on phone calls made to top Chinese Communist Party leaders asking about organ harvesting. None denied knowledge of the organ harvesting from Falun Gong practitioners. They just wanted to get on the red line to discuss it. There's been a lot written about whether the Communist Party might collapse in China due to financial problems, corruption, inequality, and so on. What will be the effect of the Communist Party of the publication of the facts about the atrocities of live organ harvesting? We have an instructive example from history. In 1940, Soviet secret police killed over 20,000 Polish officers at Kachin Forest in Russia. Stalin blamed it on the Nazis, and the regime maintained the lie for the next 50 years. In 1989, the truth emerged, and in 1990, Gorbachev admitted what happened. The massacre was also used in the power struggle between Yeltsin and Gorbachev. It strengthened the Polish resistance and crushed the moral authority of the remaining Soviet hardliners. Once something like this is unveiled, there's no going back. The same will be true for China, and the enormous crime of organ harvesting will come to define the Chinese Communist Party. Let's go back to the plot planned by Bo and Zhou. Last month, Bo was stripped of all his party posts. Um, he's been purged and is under investigation. The removal of Bo is a crippling blow to the faction that Jiang formed to persecute Falun Gong. Without Bo to take Zhou's powerful positions in the standing committee and as the head of the PLAC, this alternative power structure built to protect Jiang and his faction has basically collapsed. The future of China is now open in a way that has not been the case for a long time. This brings me to the fourth and final point. The United States doesn't need to fear the collapse of the Chinese Communist Party. Just as Jiang feared for his legacy, so too do Premier Wen Jiabao and party head Hu Jintao. Wen and Hu are scheduled to retire at the 18th Party Congress, which will most likely be in October. If they don't end the persecution of Falun Gong, they'll be forever tarred as having been complicit in it. But ending the persecution requires Hu and Wen take on the strength of the second power created by Jiang. Western countries raising Falun Gong can strengthen the hands of Hu and Wen as they fight against the rear guard actions of Jiang's faction. The US government cable made available by WikiLeaks supports this, showing that Bo Xilai may have been kept out of the vice premiership position he was vying for in 2007, precisely because of the Falun Gong lawsuits he faced overseas. Of course, if Hu and Wen end the persecution and the crimes done against Falun Gong and others are acknowledged, the Communist Party may likely end as well. There's been much written about the need for the CCP to provide stability in China. It's a big subject that I can't do justice to today, but consider the following. In several speeches, Wen Jiabao has said that the government in China should be independent of the Communist Party. This is heresy for those who believe that the Communist Party should rule China. The party can only rule if it has a monopoly of power. When Chiao Shi was head of the National People's Congress in the late 1990s, he used to say that the party should be subject to the rules of China, to the laws of China, sorry. If Wen Jiabao and Chiao Shi can speak composedly about a China in which the Communist Party does not have power over everything, we should not be afraid of the same prospect. Since this crisis began, the traffic on the Epic Times Chinese language website has seen a significant jump and now gets 6 million page views a day. 
I believe the Chinese people are now flocking to our website, not only because we provide a rare, uncensored look at China in the Chinese language, but also because of the insight we provide that makes sense of what's unfolding there today. We are able to offer that insight because we understand what I've outlined here. The crisis in China take turns on the evil of persecuting Falun Gong, and its resolution depends on the stance taken toward that evil. Thank you, Matt. Dr. Damon Noto is a physician at the Hackensack University Medical Center uh, in New Jersey. I am sure Damon would be content, would have been content, to continue in his private life as a physician with an active practice, a busy practice, um, except for one development, and that was the reports of forced live organ harvesting being carried out by doctors in China. Damon was one of the first doctors to join a new organization formed to oppose this atrocity, the Doctors Against Forced Organ Harvesting, and he became the organization's spokesperson. He is here today to speak on the topic, Doctors Seek Integrity in Dealing with China. Damon? Um. I'm a little bit humbled because this um, topic uh, about forced organ harvesting in China, one of the main people who investigated it and put out the first book, standing and sitting right next to me, David Kilgore. So um, it gives me um, honor to sit next to him and talk about this topic. I'd like to tell you about my personal experience with this topic as a medical professional here in the United States and give you the perspective of the medical community. Um, when this organization, Doctors Against Forced Organ Harvesting, began, it was an organization that started looking at the transplant situation around the world and looking for any unethical practices at the time. And over the past several years, the focus of this organization has been China, and there's many good reasons for that. Um, I'd like to give you guys a brief overview about what we've learned about China and how this situation developed. I don't know what your level of knowledge about this is, but I'll, I'm gonna go back to the beginning. Very early on in the late 1990s and in the early 2000s, we began having evidence that something unethical was going on in China's uh, transplant industry. And in 2001, a famous uh, surgeon, transplant surgeon from China came and actually attested in front of a congressional hearing that the source of organs uh, for China's transplant community was coming from executed prisoners. At the time, the communist government vehemently denied that that was truthful. Then, after that, we began getting more and more evidence that something very shady was going on. The amount of organs being transplanted, transplanted in China from 2001 to 2008 just exploded. In the 1990s, they were doing probably a few hundred transplants a year. And by the year 2008, they were doing up to 10,000 transplants a year. To put that in perspective, China today now transplants the second amount, of, the second amount most organs every year behind only us, the United States, compared to a country like uh, the UK, where they're only doing two to 3,000. The explosion was tremendous. And not only that, the amount of transplant centers in China just literally exploded. Um, from 1999, they had about 100, 150 transplant centers that we documented. And by 2007, they had over 600. Um, the, the explosion in transplantation literally took doctors really by storm. So we became alarmed then another thing happened, which made uh, physicians even more fearful about what was going on. And it was that it appeared China had an overabundance of organs, while the rest of the world, we were struggling to find organs for patients. China began to advertise through medical tourism that you could come to China and within weeks get an organ transplanted. And they weren't just talking about kidneys, they were talking about hearts and livers, which traditionally are tremendously difficult to find. Um, 
one physician, very famous transplant physician from Israel, he's a heart, heart surgeon, he gave the story that he had a patient that was waiting for a heart transplant for over a year. And that patient one day came to him and said, you know what, I'm frustrated with the situation, and I contacted a hospital in China, and they told me in two weeks, I come, I get the organ transplanted, I come back, and it'll be done. And the surgeon was shocked. He had never heard of this. And he said, okay. And in fact, that patient actually did go to China and got ex the transplantation performed exactly on the day he was told it was going to take place. And he came back and he told the physician everything went perfectly and smoothly, just as they said. This became tremendously troubling for physicians. How is it that the rest of the world was struggling to find organs when China seemed to have an overabundance? In the United States, a kidney, the average time is definitely over a year. It's usually over a year and a half to two years before you can find a kidney. Forget about hearts or livers. Secondly, the, it became very obvious to physicians that this was an extremely profitable business and that some of the hospitals in China were stating on their own websites that their number one source of revenue was coming from organ transplantation. You can imagine that the, uh, if, if you have someone that is killed for their organs and you sell or their, all their organs, the, the amount of money made up off of each person is well over $100,000. So the amount of money and the profitability of this became very, very concerning. So physicians started to say, well, does this make sense? And a lot of people would say, you know, China is the has the largest population in the world, why wouldn't it be, make sense that they transplant the second most amount of uh, transplantations in the world? The big problem we had was China officially had no public organ donation program. It just didn't exist. They had their own Red Cross trying to form a public organ transplantation system, and it failed miserably. And they quoted that uh, only three people in Beijing had stepped forward to donate organs in a 20-year time frame. And only 37 people nationwide had registered to become organ donors over a six-year time frame. And there's many reasons why they have no public organ transplant program, the major one being a cultural reason. Chinese people really believe that they should be buried alive with all their organs. So without a, a formal public organ transplant program, and even more importantly, without a distribution program, how was it that they were able to transplant 10,000 patients a year? Well, given from their own numbers, I like to use China's own numbers, the Minister of Health, Huang Jiefu, has been quoted several times recently. Um, and the latest quote back in, uh, well, not the latest, but one of the most significant quotes was that in 2005, he reported that 95% of organs transplanted in China comes from executed prisoners. That's from China's own admission. China is still the only country in the world that officially allows the practice of organ harvesting from prisoners. And in this year, 2012, he stated that this practice is going to continue for the next five years. So. When we looked at these numbers, one of the things we became concerned about was, yes, China's admitting that they're executing prisoners for their organs, and they're doing it on a mass scale. But the bigger problem for physicians was that the numbers didn't add up. So if you look at how many people uh, China executes each year, there's no official number, but by most experts, they, rec they say between two to 8,000 a year. Well, they were transplanting 10,000 people a year. So the, these numbers simply just didn't match. And furthermore, if they, I'm going to speak just loudly. If, if they don't match, and, or let's say they did execute 10,000 people each year and that they were transplanting 10,000 people each year, the problem is there's just no way you can have an exact match of those 10,000 people with the 10,000 people needing an organ. For instance, in the United States, it's about a 15 to 1 ratio, maybe even a 20 to 1 ratio of people you need to find a match for yourself. So if, if China, if these numbers hold true in China, they would need a pool of over 150,000 people 
to be able to trans transplant 10,000 people. These numbers just became very difficult for the medical community to accept. We just didn't understand it. If you look at uh, blood matching, tissue matching, the fact that these patients need to be disease free, and we know China has a very high rate of hepatitis B, which would automatically eliminate you. You can't be a trans, you can't be a donor. We also know that prison population in China usually has a higher rate of hepatitis B than the general. So the numbers didn't add up. So people started to investigate, like one of my friends here, David Kilgore. People started to investigate where are these organs coming from. And through this book, which I'd like to introduce today, State Organs, we now have tremendous amount of evidence that the majority of organs being translated into today come from prisoners of conscience. The problem that we have in China is when people are, are committed to execution, when you're found guilty of committing a crime, China's law is that you must be executed within seven days. Seven days. There's no time frame where these people are sitting around on death row waiting there. So if you're, if you're found guilty, you're executed within seven days. Once you're executed in those organs, you can't freeze these organs and save them somewhere. You only have a day or two to transplant them. So these organs are not just sitting around. So the time frame, the numbers, all these things became just tremendously concerning for us. This book has not only evidence that prisoners of conscience are being used, but it has evidence from physicians around the world's experience interacting with this system in China today. It talks about this famous physician from Israel and how he had patients going to China and coming back. And he actually implemented a new law in Israel that bans um, any insurance companies for paying for people going to China to get their organs uh, harvested, to get uh, organs transplanted. So the second thing that we found was that the largest population where we believe these organs are coming from is Falun Gong practitioners, as my, as my previous speaker came from. And the reason many physicians believe that was, one, was that the, the time frame where there was an escalation in organs being transplanted correlated perfectly with the onset of the persecution of Falun Gong practitioners and the height of the persecution of Falun Gong practitioners. And secondly, they make up the largest group of prisoners of conscience. Have we documented evidence of other groups, the Uyghurs, Tibetans being killed for their organs? Yes. But we believe by far the greatest group is from Falun Gong practitioners. So now the medical community in the United States is faced with a dilemma. We need to understand how to handle this situation. Every day you have people asking medical doctors should I go to China to get my organs? Every day, universities and hospitals in America are faced with the question, should we be training the transplant physicians coming from China? Should we be doing collaborative research with hospitals in China on organ transplantation? We have pharmaceutical companies here in the United States not only doing clinical trials on new drugs to come out and help for transplantation in China, but they're also supplying the drugs to do these transplantations in China. So we need to know as a medical profession every amount of information that's out there to make an informed decision. Otherwise, we're complicit. We are part of this problem. You know, the speaker prior, prior to me mentioned this case of Wang Lijun, and he came to the U.S. Embassy possibly to seek asylum. We know that this guy, by his own self-admission, was involved in thousands of these forced organ transplantations. And he was even given a award in China for his role in forced organ transplantation. We know he met with officials, and we've asked for those official transcripts to see if there's any more evidence that we have that can document what's going on in China so we can make an informed decision. We're asking our representatives in government we're asking them, please, help us get as much information as we can so we can make these decisions. Right now, we have physicians fighting in medical journals to ban the use of research that comes out of China so it can't be published. But we don't have 
as much evidence as we would like to have to say definitively we need to stop this. So any evidence we can get from the State Department, we would just gladly, we would cherish. Um, I'm going to finish by saying a lot of times I've, and I've given talks around the country and even in other countries about this situation, I feel I failed to give the audience the gravity of this situation, the enormity of the situation. And many physicians feel we're, we only know the tip of the iceberg and that when all the evidence is released, we're going to be overwhelmed, really, with what's going on in China today. So I hope that through my talk today, you get a better understanding of the situation and the real seriousness of it. Thank you. Thank you, Damon. When I'm, when I'm editing a story on China, and find something about the Chinese Communist Party that I don't understand. Um, I know that there's one source I can go to who, if anyone can, can make sense of this notoriously closed uh, organization. Uh, Yi Yang Sha is Senior Director of Policy and Research with the Washington, D.C.-based Human Rights Law Foundation. Uh, Mr. Shah is an expert on Chinese politics and the structure and functioning of the Chinese propaganda in judicial systems. He's presented his research and analysis at the European Parliament, United Nations Human Rights Commission, and academic institutions here in the United States and in Southeast Asia. Today he'll speak on how maintaining stability undermines stability in China. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Um, let me start with a story everybody knows. Uh, when U.S. Uh, delegation went to China to discuss the fate of the blind lawyer Chen Guangcheng, everything went smoothly. And Chen Guangcheng decided to stay in China and uh, enter the universities to study law. And everybody's happy. And when he left the uh, U.S. embassy, something happened. And he changed his mind. That not only surprised the United States, but also surprised the Chinese government. So something must happen. It's not only his friend's call. He himself felt the danger of his life. He's afraid of his life and his family's life. So he changed the mind. What happened? So we can, uh, from the other source, we can see what happened that during that time, the US delegation actually discussed with the um, formal Chinese delegation, that's the uh, foreign minister, um, uh, people from Ministry of Foreign Affairs. But they knew the foreign affairs is weak. They must find somebody can make the decision stronger. So they talk to the secret police. And the secret police is the problem to make the trouble for Chen Guangcheng issue. They have the conflict interest. They cannot get involved in the discussion. Even though the secret police cannot make the decision of Chen Guangcheng, you know, the discussion, they cannot make the decision, but they, know, they knew every step the government. Uh, they knew every, every step that Chen Guangcheng is going to go through. So once Chen Guangcheng left the uh, embassy, they knew exactly when and where to strike. If you, if you go through the whole issue, and the secret police, who is behind it? That's the PLC. There's a political and legal affairs uh, committee. That's uh, belong to the Chinese Communist Party. It's not government body. So actually, when you don't know who you are dealing with, that would be the trouble. Actually, why it's also surprised the Chinese government because uh, the discussion was made, decision was made by the Chinese leadership. But at that time, actually, there's a second power center in China. That's the PLC. It represents the police force, the security force. So we needed to discuss how this organization, uh, this uh, second uh, power center formed and how it works in Ch uh, current China. First is uh, uh, current years, actually, the Chinese reform, China model hit the wall. Everybody knows, especially the Chinese leaders. When something hit the wall, you have to turn, either turn left or right. So 
In the ideologically, um, they turned two directions. One is uh, represented by Bo Xilai. That's seeing the revolution, seeing the revolution not his song and uh, hit the black, fighting the criminals with the illegal measures. That's what Bo Xilai did. And uh, then another turn is made by Wen Jiabao, try to get some uh, a political reform in China, but that didn't go well. Uh, either way, so Bo Xilai's model collapsed, and uh, Wen Jiabao's model has never started. This is one part. Another part is the social turmoil. The social turmoil is the one we need to discuss. How the Chinese government, uh, the Chinese Communist Party, form the mechanism to handle this social uh, turmoil. For the past 30 years, uh, economic ref reform actually at the cost of human rights, the environment, and the natural resources, they cannot continue. And uh, that makes the social conflict becomes uh, very hot. So uh, the Chinese Communist Party come out to the resolution is called the maintaining stability. That's the way to solve the social turmoil. Wang Lijun, Bo Xilai, actually, they initiate this so called uh, Hit the Black campaign. And the Bo Xilai, Zhou Yongkang conspiracy is also uh, and Chen Guangcheng is escaping, and the recently Shi Fang um, protest of the environment uh, last month, the protest, they all uh, point to the same direction. That's the PLC. That's the maintenance uh, stability was managed by this PLC. The concept of maintaining stability was first introduced in 1990s. However, since it was not a priority for CTP leaders at the time, there was no formal structure to implement it, and it received little attention from observers either at home or abroad. This changed in the run-up of the Beijing Olympics in August 2008. Early that year, amidst a rising social unrest and fear that the sign of a turbulent um, turbulence was the surface while the country was in the international spotlight. The CCP rulers felt it necessary to set up a leadership team to prevent such an occurrence. Um, since 1950s, the CCP has used such a leadership team to coordinate actions on various issues, including the Cultural Revolution. The newly established team was called the CCP Central Committee's Leadership Team for Maintaining Stability. And the head of PRAC, Zhou Yongkang, become, was appointed to head it, head this uh, new leadership team. As is typical for such a team, an office under the leadership group was set up to handle daily tasks. It was called Office for Maintaining Stability. Liu Jun, the then uh, Vice Minister of Public Security, was appointed to direct it. The new leadership team and office Immediate task was the maintaining stability before and during the Olympics. But in practice, after Olympics, the same measure continues. So it, it is called normalization of Olympic security. It means even after the Olympics, the security measures used during Olympics would become the routine practice. Um, there are different uh, departments and the committees inside the, the Chinese Communist leadership. There, there, there are four departments permanent, and five to six different committees and the leadership teams. And the four of them cons, you know, involved in the maintenance stability and was headed by Zhou Yongkang. That's why Zhou Yongkang's power, even though he is the last one in the standing committee of the political bureau, but uh, he's the most powerful man because uh, most of the committee and the leadership team was headed by him. One person controlled four committees. And one of them, okay, this uh, mechanism is very strange to even Chinese. It's a, it's a positive, it's a positive feedback system. Usually in China, if somebody in charge a field and this caused a problem, then he will be demoted, or at least stop promotion. But uh, for the maintenance stability, once you have problem, you get more money, you get more power. 
if there's a conflict between the people and the local government, you need the manpower to crack down, suppress. You need the money. So they, have, they get stronger and stronger once the social turmoil becomes bigger. So they benefit from the social unrest, not social stability. Chen Guangcheng is a very good example. When Chen Guangcheng was the first put in jail because he had conflict uh, defending uh, with the government, defending those women, um, you know, was a forced uh, uh, abortion. And uh, that's the routine job in everywhere. But once he was released from prison, he was immediately put at home and they convert his home as a new prison. And this caused the problem. They need money to convert the whole village as a, as a part of the prison. And they need money, they need manpower. So they ask for it. Since they, um, this whole process was under the name of the maintenance stability, and then more and more money we invest into it. According to Chen Guangcheng, uh, in 2008, it's about 4.7 million US dollars used on himself, one person. Three years later, this number doubled. So it's 9.4 million US dollars to monitor one person. So they get more and more money be as the reward of being doing bad job to maintain maintaining stability. So the maintaining stability, since it started, more and more conflict, social turmoil become the problem, and the outsiders can see all the changes. And uh, this year is the second year, the maintenance stability budget, it's called the public security budget, is uh, in a budget is more than military spending. This is the second year. So this is uh, never happened before. And uh, that's why the Zhou Yongkang and his power become um, you know, even danger the uh, CCP's rule. This is a Chen Guangcheng issue. Um, and the two other cases I can give you example. One example is uh, the Sixth Day Office. The Sixth Day Office was established in 1990, um, in June 10th, 1999, was uh, established to persecute Falun Gong. And once it's established, the persecution is their best interest. So as long as the persecution continues, they will get the manpower and the budget. And uh, this, uh, this office has the uh, power to, to carry out the persecution, to collect the information, to give the suggestions for the policy makers. So all in one. So they always make the issue bigger, and they always make the issue uh, need to continue. So the policy makers are getting the information from this organization who carry out the persecution. This is the sixth office. And also, the maintaining stability actually is uh, originated from the sixth office. So people get confused, they said that they changed the name, actually they didn't change the name. Just, uh, you know, the target, the sixth office target is Falun Gong practitioners, and the maintaining stability office target is wide to everybody. But their head are the same. You know, the maintenance stability and the persecution of Falun Gong, the leadership team, the same person, Zhou Yongkang. The first office director, Liu Jing, same person. So people confused, thought this is the same office, but actually they are not. They are separate. But you can see the mechanism to persecution Falun Gong, persecute Falun Gong, immediately transfer to persecute to the wide range of the populations. And another example is Tibet. We can see the Tibetan issue getting worse and worse. And uh, people always ask why the Chinese Communist Party won't sit down to talk to Dalai Lama. Because Dalai Lama already gave up the independence. And that fits Communist Party's requirement. Why they don't sit down? Because uh, one, the Chinese Communist Party need an enemy, always need an enemy uh, somewhere. So there's, if there's no one, they will create a one. The second one is uh, there's an interest group formed against uh, the, the in the Tibetan independence. The officials who worked in Tibet, has ever worked in Tibet, all the scholars, all the security, security force who involved in the Tibetan issue, they have 
you know, they have carried out the persecution for so many years, and they create theories and they create policies to continue to make this Tibetan independence a big issue. As long as this is a big issue, they have all the interest to gain. Uh, so there's uh, no way. So anything concerned uh, social stability will be this uh, very strange feedback. It will never stop. It will getting worse and worse. Okay, I think. Um, uh, so the political turmoil is only the tip of the iceberg. The maintaining stability policy is based on the fact that China economic development is at the cost of human rights, the environment, and the natural resources. Any model, Chongqing model actually, it is China model. Chongqing model or China model won't last long if it is based on that. Uh, try not to bend our value and the principles is our best interest. Because if we, we bend to their interest, that, that will, there's no our interest at all. Thank you. Thank you, Yang. Um, OK, now let's open the floor for um, Questions, discussion, uh, comments. 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 Uh, let's let's start up here. Are any comments from our panel before we open up to the audience? Okay. Questions from the audience? Yes, we 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 have a mic here so that uh, you can be easily heard. So I guess my question is for Matthew Robertson and Yi Yang Xia. If Bo Xi Lai and Zhou Yang Kang have been working together, do we should we expect a purge of Zhou Yang Kang coming anytime soon or? Because he's still in power. And what is keeping him in power as opposed to Bo Xi Lai? OK, um, uh, I, I think the first thing is uh, uh, in the 18th people, uh, People's uh, Party's Congress, Zhou Yong Kang will be out anyway. So it's not necessary to get him out now. But uh, the Chinese Communist Party now is uh, um, experiencing the biggest hit during his ruling, 63 years ruling. They, the Communist Party didn't want this getting bigger. So they tried to limit the uh, acquisition to Bo Xilai on the uh, regular crime, not the political. Actually, uh, I have uh, uh, wrote a, uh, an article about uh, four possible acquisitions, but they only used the last one. Because the first one is uh, go back to Cultural Revolution. That will hit Communist Party's ideology, and the second acquisition will be the um, the, the hit the black. That will hit Chinese the whole nations, uh, uh, you know, illegally um, carry out the persecution to people, you know, out of law. So they won't do it, and uh, you know the three options they they won't do it. They try to damage control. It's not they don't want to get rid of him. They just don't know how to get rid of him at the same time keep the face or the rule of Chinese Communist Party. Yes, please. OK, so first of all, I have a comment, then I have a question. Uh, before that, I want to point out, um, I'm 17. I'm a Chinese student. I'm a citizen of China. I study in the United States. And next year, I'll be going to Vancouver for one year from my last year of high school. And my first comment is that um, I'm flattered whenever Westerners talk about Chinese human rights and they say they care about my human rights, I'm flattered. But at the same time, I'm confused. I'm confused because um, I, I doubt that Westerners have the credibility to talk about human rights in China and say they care about Chinese people. And I don't feel that strongly about it, but I would like to present a popular interpretation from the Chinese uh, teenagers, my peers, and my generation. The interpretation is that the Westerners didn't care about Chinese human rights during the Opium War and during history. And why should we trust the Westerners today? And the other interpretation is that um, diplomatically, the United States is trying to build a relationship with Vietnam, with Laos, the previous enemies of the US, and strengthening its relationship with South Korea, uh, Japan, India, we see that as U.S. building up diplomatic relationships to try to limit the growth of China. And domestically, the U.S. Spon not sponsor, but supports human rights movements, human rights activists, the independence of Tibet, and all those groups to create sort of a social chaos in China. And that's, that's a, a popular 
Chinese and comprehension among my generation. And I'm not a strong support of that, but I would like to point it out and hear your response and how you sort of react to that and address that to the Chinese people, the very people that we're claiming to try to help. And my question is, today, what you've done is identify the problems in China. And some of them are shocking to me, some of them are uh, stuff I already know, but I appreciate that very much. And my question is, after addressing the problems, what's the solution? How, how do you solve the problem? Because you mentioned in the packet that um, stuff like democracy, multi-party democracy, are universal um, human values. I have my reservations for that. I think, I think, I think there's something narcissistic about Western countries, um, for the NATO countries, consists of 12% of the human population, and having that sense of supremacy to say that we have our values of multi-party democracy, and we would like to impose that on the rest of the world. I think there's something dangerous about that assumption. Because the Chinese response is, we view the West as imperialistic during history. And we have reservations today for that. So I'd like to hear your response if possible. Thank you, Roman. Very well stated. You, uh, you'll do well in Vancouver. I hope you like Vancouver. And by uh, complete coincidence, I had a friend who and his wife who visited my wife and I this week in, in Ottawa, and he and I articled together in Vancouver, and he's now been a judge for 38 years in uh, BC. And he uh, was telling me things, for example, the, uh, the, uh, the Provincial Registry Act of 1875, can you imagine, ladies and gentlemen, it banned you from being on the voters list if you were, uh, if you were from China, if you were from Asia, if you were a Hindu, can you imagine? They were actually trying to make it impossible for people of Sikh faith to vote, but they said Hindus, they didn't know any better. That's the kind of stupidity that, and, and Canada, as you, we will hear when you get there, has a terrible record. Until about 1949, then things started to change, and now it's completely, uh, I hope you'll find, changed. And But your points about the Opium War are absolutely true. And, uh, uh, Britain should be ashamed of itself over that, and and uh, many things that we should be ashamed about. It. But what we're t we're trying to say, I think, all of us up here, is that human beings are equal, and that uh, universal values don't just apply to you if you're from North America or, or somewhere else. You, they apply just as much to people in in China or Taiwan or Indonesia or anywhere else. And uh, same with democracy. Democracy isn't there because it's a Western construct. It's there to give people a chance to live. Uh, in peace and live well. And uh, just to give you one example, and you probably know this, that in t I was at the elections in Taiwan as an observer, and uh, their uh, per capita income was about $250 25 years ago. Now I think it's $37,000. Whereas the per capita income in, in China, as, as you know better than I do, is about five, I think, five or six. So yes, if you live on the East Coast and you're, um, and you're uh, and you were at the National People's Congress, I noticed they had 61 billionaires at the Congress. These are hand-picked party people. What I'm trying to say is that the system in China works for the people who are in the party, and you heard this from everybody up here. But the poor man or woman who lives in, in West China, some of them, as you know, are living terrible lives. We are trying to do something about human dignity for everybody, and uh, China happens to be the largest uh, totalitarian system in the world right now. And we've, the world would be a wonderful place if, if democracy and human dignity came to China. And I'm, sh I'm sure you agree with it. It's not a Western construct. It's an idea of giving everybody a chance to have a decent life. Go ahead. I'm sure you've got lots to say. I have reservations. As a person, I do have reservations for democratic system. But I believe that people should have equal opportunities to be able to start with. But the, the, the concept that a college professor, a really knowledgeable person, he supposed to the same as a high school dropout that doesn't really care, and he doesn't make the same effort. Confucius was against that. A lot of Chinese people are not OK with that. We think it's hard to make everybody born equal. We should create equal opportunities. But if you work harder, you should have a longer say and have more power. Confucius almost supports an aristocracy, and I do too. And I think um, that is. Again, a popular concept around Chinese people that's defined by Chinese culture, and I think by Confucian culture as well. So I have reservations when you say that democracy should be a universal value. I think, I think that's something that Westerners sort of need to realize, that every nation has a right to adopt a system that suits their nation. And it should be decided by the people. It should also be decided by the time, the time frame. First, 
Um, this is uh, not about uh, democracy, it's about the freedom, it's about, about, about the basic rights. So this is the two issues. First, the, the current value in China promoting the value is Western value, it's Marxism. It's not Confucianism. Actually, if you consider the history, in, in the end of the Qing Dynasty and the early uh, uh, Republic of China, the re political reform was promoted by new Confucianism. It's not by Western values. Actually, the new Confucianism combined Western values and the Chinese traditional values very, very well until the Communist Party come to the stage. Uh, so this is no conflict between Chinese culture and uh, universal values, democracy or not. This is not important from, from my opinion. And uh, so this will be, um, if you read the end of the Qing Dynasty, the more, that's why the, the Xinhai Revolution actually is kind of close to the uh, British, Re British Revolution. It's not used the violence to overthrow. Actually, it's, uh, it's one soldier's one, um, one soldier rebel, rebel to, the, uh, to protect his uh, uh, squad leader and cause all the provinces independence. So it's kind of uh, continue the end of the Qing Dynasty's reform to the uh, Republic of China. And uh, so I will say the, the resolution based on two. One is uh, restore the traditional Chinese value restore the traditional Chinese culture. This is uh, being destroyed for the past 60 years, systematically destroyed, replaced by the uh, communist and Marxism ideology. This is, uh, yeah, re this is uh, one restore, and uh, in the same time accept the universal value. And uh, this was not, can be forced by the Western values. Western values will be accepted only when those people accept it. But Nowadays, you can see in China, most people try to get rid of the communist value. So it's the trend, and it's, it will continue. And if you look at the, uh, you know, go to the Weibo or the blog or the Chinese uh, micro blog, you will see the trend is very, it's obviously, you can see it. But I want to go back to my question, because I, don't, I think I'm hearing an answer to my questions. Maybe I'm, I, was, I didn't address the question too well. The first question is about credibility. The second line is about solution, and I want to elaborate. This exchange has been very helpful and, um, and very useful in, in uh, helping articulate in a, a clear way um, the uh, uh, public case that is made for the Communist Party. Um, you know, I, I, th I would personally say the solution to the problems we're talking about today is the dissolution of the Communist Party. That that's where uh, any solution for the problems plaguing China today begins. But uh, in order to go case by case, why I believe that's the best solution would take a very long time, uh, as would uh, responding to the demand that uh, the uh, uh, West uh, prove that it is, uh, is credible and therefore has the uh, uh, right to uh, uh, to. Uh, care about what's happening uh, inside China. The simple question is, that seems too radical for me, but who's going to replace the party? Who's going to replace the leadership? We have, we have two other hands up in the audience who'd like to, I think, take part, or three other hands who'd like to take part. So please, back here. I'm a physician, and uh, I want to salute uh, Dr. Dana Nodo's uh, speech. And I also want to thank Honorable uh, David Kilgore, your book, Bloody Harvest, was one of the first resources I turned to when I heard allegation that uh, Falun Gong practitioners were harvest workers while they still alive. I found it shocking. I couldn't believe it. I cried for days. And I continued to research for more evidence. And I also heard the new book, State Organs. In my heart, I still want to refuse this has happened and this still happening. Because in my heart, I know as a physician and as a human, we all commit to do not harm this ethics. I will not be able to imagine my fellow physicians in China 
would pick up a knife, cut open a human body, take out organs, and sell them. When I called my colleagues in China, when I cried over the phone and told them about this, one of my colleagues said, you've been staying in the United States for too long. Of course this happened. Why are you surprised? So I think as a Chinese um, American, growing up in China, I still have that patriotic emotion, very strong, very strong. I won't believe China will become better China. I won't believe my government, Chinese government, would not do such a thing to their own citizen. But unfortunately, I think it happened. And what will be the solution? So that's my question to Dr. Damon Nolte. What do you think will be the solution? Now, when I went to Boston in June 2012, I talked to many physicians uh, from all over the world, and including those in, from China. They are one of the few physicians who would not talk to me. Other physicians, the people from imperialistic countries, from the United States, from Canada, from Can Europe. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Stopped by, they listened, they said, oh my goodness, I can't believe it happened, but they shared stories, their patients going to China and did the surgery and came back. So their sanitization, so solutions, and I said, it's coming from your heart. If your heart is touched by the story, then there's a solution and there's a voice. But I still want to hear from Dr. Damon Nota. What other solution can you recommend? Thank you. I can tell you the solution is not to wait five years, as what China is saying right now, and gradually go to a public organ donation program. If that's the case, you have about, an estimate, probably 50 to 60,000 more people will die for the organ in the next five years. That's definitely not the solution. My idea of the solution is strong education. It's not a simple process. It didn't, in the United States, it didn't happen overnight that we have a transplant system that we transplanted over 10,000 years. It took dedicated physicians, public uh, education programs. It's not, it's not a simple thing. But I can tell you, killing innocent people for their organs, profiting from that, that needs to stop right away. It's just, it's just clear on that. So, if you're telling me, doctor, give me a quick solution right now, we'll fix it. There's no quick solution. It takes time. It takes education. It takes dedication. So my idea is stop it immediately, and let's start this education process now. And if we had a democracy in China, this would not be happening. Uh, one of the things that Taiwan did, maybe you mentioned before, that uh, when they learned that this was happening in China, they, and a lot of people in Taiwan, as you know, being going to China for organs, uh, they did their best to stop it. And uh, so that's another reason why our friend in the corner here should uh, want a democracy to come to China, because the, the, this sort of practice would never have started in China if it had been a democracy like that. Yes, please. Yes, I just want to address quickly that I was born in China, and I was raised in China. I came to uh, study abroad uh, in the US. So I believe uh, the gentleman, that gentleman just addressed the issue. Um, the, the way we look at it, like Chinese, because we have this cultural difference, so we may look at it a um, little differently. So, but eventually, I believe, personal belief is that, um, in principle, people should live with freedom, with dignity. I guess that's the fundamental thing that everybody should agree upon. But then the form, how do you live uh, like with freedom and uh, dignity? That may differ uh, with different culture, different country. So uh, democracy may be um, so that the gentleman addressed question that he, he had some issue with democracy, but that's okay. But what we discuss today, I believe, is that people, everybody should live with freedom and dignity and shouldn't be treated and with the constant fear that someone may take your organs and and against your will. I think that's the 
issue we're discussing today. And based on the specific solution, um, I like now I'm probably older than you are, and I'm more than 30. So my issue, my my personally think, thinking is that my thought is that we just go as we um, as long as I know I'm in the right direction, I'm happy. I know I will reach the, I will see the light at the end of the tunnel. And um, that's, that will give me, give me courage. And I can go to that end. Uh, my name is Sean Lane from the Sound Hub Radio. I have a question for the panelists. Uh, assume, uh, Dr. Damon Noto, you mentioned about uh, the scale of, of the atrocity of the organ harvesting. I was wondering, um, do you have any data on how many physicians in China are involved in these crimes? And um, uh, what kind of measures does the government take to try to control these physicians? I would guess some of the physicians may have the, you know, conscience in their heart, and maybe some people want to deny these predators. Maybe some people want to speak out. So for the CCP, how do they control this population of physicians who are involved in this uh, organ harvesting? Any of you have any you know, uh, data to suggest? And also, regarding the Western society, how to uh, apply influence in China? Any way to talk to these physicians directly? You know, if this physician quit the practice, then things will change. Well, I just give an easy estimate. There's, there's thousands of transplant physicians in China. But one thing I didn't address, and I, I should have, the reason we believe that this forced organ harvesting is possible in China is because of the system in place is usually run by the military, meaning the prison camps, the labor camps, and the hospitals are all in control by the military. Without this single fact, the possibility of forced organ harvesting probably couldn't exist. So when you have the military controlling these three factions, and, and even controlling the surgeons, these are you know military personnel who are following quote unquote orders. So, an atrocity like this can happen, especially when you have a population of people who the Chinese government considers expendable. So, you know, when we talk about getting information out of China, it's, it's very hard, as you can imagine. And, and physicians that have come forth, and transplant surgeons have come forth, have done it at the risk of their own life. You could imagine if they get caught and, and they expose their name. These people could go to jail, who knows, tortured. So we do have confessions from physicians and witnesses of this taking place, but they usually want to be anonymous. It is very hard to get you know this hard evidence. And you know David Kilmer who did the, the research can attest to that. Yeah, we we uh, just uh, this new book by the way, State Organs uh, it's uh, Fascinating. Uh, David Vegas writes in his chapter on numbers. He says, this is the first paragraph. How many organ transplants are there each year in China? What are the sources of the organs? He says, Kilgore and I, in a report published, concluded there were 41,500 transplants for a six year period, 2000 to 2005, where the only explanation for the sourcing was Falun Gong practitioners. The whole, this whole chapter should be on the numbers. Of the Organs, but it's uh, what I, I always cite because it's the one that hit me the hardest was a man, and I won't tell you what country he came from, but he uh, he needed a new um, yet hep, hep C. He needed a new uh, kidney. He went to the number one people's hospital in Shanghai, and a military surgeon in uniform, Dr. Tan, we talk about it in the book, came to him and took his tissue type and blood type and had a list of. And he went down the list and he got to a name and he went away and came back in about four hours with a vial with, with two, uh, two kidneys in it. Uh, this happened eight times, ladies and gentlemen, before he got a kidney that was compatible with him. And then he went home for three months and came back. So it was, he made two trips to Shanghai and he finally got an organ that was compatible. And he's now doing fine. I saw him when I was in his country and he's uh, just great. But eight human beings, and I'm sure a good many of them were found dog practitioners were killed like some lobster in a, in a grotesque restaurant because they happened to be the right body type, tissue type, they thought, for this guy. And that's the argument why the system in China is wrong. Human beings have the value of a matchstick in China. And to the doctor here, 
That's the problem with uh, totalitarianism, whether it's Nazism or communism. Yeah, um, to reply. <laughs> I, I have to leave. I, I work for the American Congress and it keep, keeps me busy. Um, my, my last remark is just that, you know, you've identified the problems, I think that's great. Um, it's shocking to, for me to hear some of the news, but I appreciate that. And I think if you really want to help Chinese people and you care about Chinese people, for anyone uh, from the Western world who care about China, offer a solution. Um, simply saying, let's replace the Communist Party, that's not going to work. First of all, how do, how do we do that? Uh, it would be a, a grave, show a grave lack of responsibility on my part and any human being's part if they were aware of the, not just the atrocity of organ harvesting, but the uh, uh, tremendous injustice done to those whose homes are taken away, the tremendous problems with the poisons in the environment and the agricultural system. Uh, there's a very long list of uh, ways in which human dignity and life are violated quite casually in China. And I think that uh, all human beings have a responsibility when they see such terrible things uh, to speak up. And one doesn't need to, as a human being, to prove your credibility for that. And I, I think you need to ask yourself, why do you need to ask for someone's credibility if they are uh, saying that there's something terrible going on and it has to stop? Why does one need to have credibility to say that? So, uh, you know, I think that, the, uh, that there are proposals in China for a solution. I don't think there's going to be a single policy solution coming from this panel or any panel in D.C., but I, I do think that uh, we all have a responsibility uh, uh, to, to speak up and support uh, decency. I, I, wasn't, I wasn't questioning you. I was just asking for how do I do it? If I want a democracy in China, I can't just go on the street and say let's have democracy. I probably got aggressive. Can I uh, answer your question? The, the, the question actually is not what we are trying to do with China, you know, change China. The change comes from China. It's inside China. The change is happening in China. No, no, no. No, any change, the change is not determined by the government, actually, it's by the people. The Chinese people make the decision. They probably wrongfully accepted the Chinese Communist Party 63 years ago, but... Uh, military the Chinese government, the people Yes, but... The military on the people's side, we make the decision. Uh, okay, <laughs> we don't have to argue with, about this. So when the Soviet Union collapsed, nobody uh, really understand why it collapsed, and it still has the military. So the military is not the decision, it's people's heart is the decision. And we just need to know who we are dealing with. Uh, according to, you know, the, the we know yourself and you know, know your opponent, and then you will fight uh, 100 battles without failure. That's, that's the thing we should do. Um, you know, we must know what's happening. Uh, just like uh, um, somebody said about the culture, about the Tibetan culture was destroyed, but uh, it's not a Han culture destroying Tibetan culture. It's communist culture destroying Tibetan culture. They destroy the Han culture first, and then destroy Tibetan culture right now. So Han people and Tibetan people live in harmony for a thousand years until communists come along. So it's not about the Han and the Tibetan culture, it's about the communists. It's nothing to do with the culture conflict between Han nationality and the Tibetan nationality. Uh, I'd like to see if there are any other questions or voices that would like to be raised. Yes, please. Uh, we know that annually uh, U.S. and China have the human rights dialogue. It's coming right next week. Yeah, at this time, I think it's very interesting to have this discussion. Uh, could you give some suggestions how U.S. government can be more effectively help China to, um, or push China to respect the human rights? Well, we had our, Canada had our human rights dialogue with them quite recently, and, they, and what happened was the, uh, a friend of mine took part in those discussions. Basically, any time anyone raised even so gently a human rights issue, a professor who had been brought all the way from the Central Party School would give a 20-minute lecture saying something like, you didn't treat the First Nations in Canada right or something, and either it's absolutely true, but they just ignore them. 
and uh, it's been a we've actually are talking I think we've actually discontinued it in Canada because it goes nowhere they just send people from the from the to give lectures and it gets nowhere so maybe this United States government should look at whether these dialogues are getting anywhere too but what what do, what do the rest of you say but before you talk you need to know who you are talking to don't make the mistake with the Chen Guangcheng issue you know you talk to the security secret police who you know, made trouble, created the trouble. You cannot talk to those people. So actually, you have to find some people, talk to them, and say, that, are you in charge of the whole issue? <laughs> if you are, then we talk to you. So at least you, you have to know your opponent. He makes the point of knowing who you're talking to. I'll, I'll give you the, the example of physicians. When the um, first physician that came out of China saying that uh, people were being executed for their organs in 2001, the World Medical Organization asked China, is this happening? And the CCP's official stance was, no, definitely not happening, no. The evidence kept mounting. 2005, there was just undeniable evidence that they were being executed for organs. China finally came out and said, yes, it is happening. So the World Medical Organization made them sign a pact saying, you're not going to do this anymore. And they said, yes, definitely not going to do it anymore. We're going to stop. Two years later, they came back to the world. Oops, we're still doing it. We're sorry, but you know what? Give us five years. Five years, we'll fix it in the next five years. So when you talk about knowing who you're doing, we're naive to think, let's give more time, more time, more time. The problem is, in that time period, 60,000 people have been killed for the world. In another five years, 50, 60,000 people. To me, that, that time factor is just, it's just not worth it. Um, okay, I'd like to thank you all for, uh, for coming. And I hope this has been a, a helpful discussion. Um, the, the, the young man, uh, the 17 year old man, raised some, some serious questions and uh, occupied a lot of our time. But I, I hope it was useful to, uh, to hear him and get us to think. He articulated very clearly um, the, many of the talking points of uh, 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 communist propaganda, that uh, when you meet students who come here to college, uh, they often say very similar things. And uh, we need to have conversations with these young people from China and uh, take their objections seriously and, and help them see that there's many things they, they need to understand, which they don't. So for that particular reason, I hope this forum was helpful, but I also hope it was helpful for others here in the audience, and I want to thank you for coming. <laughs>